And good afternoon for the official start of World Oregon's webinar today. Thank you so much for joining us, whether you're zooming in from Oregon or from around the world uh, for today's webinar, what is happening to the Uyghur people in China with uh, several outstanding panelists. Before we get to today's event, uh, just a couple uh, general points uh, for those who haven't joined a Zoom webinar with World Oregon before. Um, all audience members are muted with your video off. You can pose questions in the Q&A session later for our participants. We will be posting links in the chat to interest items of interest, for instance, the website for the campaign for Uyghurs. Um, please post your questions in the Q&A rather than the chat that helps us to manage them for our panelists. Uh, Q&A will be moderated by my colleague, Tim DeRoche, Director of Programs, who you will hear in audio, but we're gonna keep the spotlight on our panelists. Um, if you have time tomorrow, join us for an event on America and Iran, uh, same time, noon. Uh, that is on uh, December 1st at noon, and we will post the link for registration in the chat here shortly. Again, before we get into today's event, just want to remind everyone that this event is made possible by uh, the sponsors and members of World Oregon. We try to have as many of our webinars free as possible. If you're not already a member, I encourage you to join or donate today, especially because today is Giving Tuesday. And whether it's with World Oregon or another nonprofit um, campaign or, or, or philanthropic uh, institution or nonprofit of your choice, I encourage you to support the nonprofit sector today on Giving Tuesday. Um, and we will post a link in the chat for that as well. And now without further ado, we're very excited to be partnering with the Never Again Coalition, uh, the Portland State's Holocaust and Genocide Studies Project for this very important and serious uh, webinar today on the Uyghur people of China. Uh, on the website of World Oregon has the full bios of two of our speakers. Uh, we are also joined by an additional bonus speaker, um, Ms. Julie Millsap, who uh, is the Director of Public Affairs and Advocacy for the campaign for Uyghurs. And she will be um, uh, making some comments at the opening of, of the program. One of our speakers is coming from another event and will be joining us at the bottom of the hour. Um, that's um, Ms. Abbas. And uh, she is the founder and executive director of Campaign for Uyghurs. Our other panelist who's here, as you can see on, uh, on, on, on the screen is Mr. Abdul Hakim Idris. Uh, who has been a longtime advocate for um, the rights of the Uyghur people and uh, the, the diaspora. And there's a, a very impressive and long bio on him on our website. Uh, I would note especially that he's the founder and executive director of the Center for Uyghur Studies, which is a Washington DC based think tank. We're gonna pass the mic over to the two of them uh, for some opening comments and discussion. And then as the program goes on, Tim will start weaving in your question. As I mentioned, our other panelists will be joining us, you know, around about 1230 or a little after coming from another event. So without further ado, I'm going to hand this over to our two panelists. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Uh, hello, and thank you for having me here today. It's my honor to speak on these vital issues from my perspective as an Uyghur. As our topic is continued to threats to the Uyghur culture, language, and identity, I want to acknowledge that this all starts with the attempt to erase our voices and the even historical perspective. I wrote the book Menace with the goal of delivering a serious warning to the world. Not only are millions of my pe people facing a grave threat to their very existence, but also the future of the free world is at stake. It seems that the international community will wake up only when the academic freedom and the free speech have already been compromised beyond the repair. We must prevent this. From the Uyghur perspective gained from the living through Chinese colonization and experiencing their brutality, we can accurately warn against the danger of the CCP. Beijing used its despotic power to determine what's wrong and the right. They try to decide how long we live and when we die. If the world wants to know what the world looked like under Chinese domination, they can find it right now in Istriksan. 
The ongoing uh, tactics to erase our identity and the claims to our home and tradition manifest in different ways, but start with the rewriting history to ignore the decade of oppression that we have suffered in our homeland. Ever since the 1949 invasion of this Turkestan, Beijing has enacted a policy of assimilation that aimed to temper the population of the Uyghurs by moving Han Chinese into the region. The CCP understand that the presence of unified culture, ethnic group outside the identity defined as a superior by the CCP's presents a significant threat. From their view, it might create resistance to their expansion of power. And as such, it must be destroyed. There was a period during the 1980s when the CCP regime seemingly tolerated the Uyghur people. The period began in 1979 when the Soviet Union invaded East Turkestan's neighbor, Afghanistan, while the USSR was backing, uh, backing Vietnam in a war against China. China stuck between two fronts had to temporarily tolerate the Uyghurs to study their own language and to publish Uyghur books, build the mosques, and to take a part in cultural studies. Even allowed the Uyghur student the movements in the mid 80s to keep them happy and avoid influence of the USSR on Uyghurs. However, the so-called golden period gradually disappeared with the withdrawal of the Soviet Union from Afghanistan, 1989. The Tiananmen Square, Square massacre that took place that same year showed that the Chinese Communist Party was never in favor of human rights and democracy. After 9-11 terrorist attack, the America's war on terror was used by CCP as justification for continuing its repressive policy. And the Uyghur were painted as a separatist and terrorist. Uyghurs around the world were falsely accused of terrorism and deported to prison in China and abroad. Now, with the millions in camp and the forced labor and the cruel genocidal crimes on full display, we see also that the tactic used to eliminate our identity include the language of extremism. By instituting brutal policy, which result in destruction of the culture and the physical space and presence of Uyghur people on the pretext of these goals to fight extremism, there are placing blame of action which have not occurred an entire face group or culture. They, grou they grouped all societal ills together for the, this purpose and they have thrown an entire population in the concentration camps. This is also supported by the intensive propaganda campaign. This is particularly notable in Turkic and the Muslim countries, who alongside other international actors completely ignored the situation in Turkestan. All societies, especially Islam, Islamic one, have been victims of the CCP propaganda mechanism. In Iran, in Gulf state, Egypt, Pakistan, and the many other places, social media accounts, TV, and the print media engage in self-censorship and targeted by the Chinese lobbyists to, that it's impossible to see any news on Uyghurs. In fact, oftentimes Chinese fake news is broadcast. As a result, civic society remain unaware of the crimes of the CCP and its war on Islam, as it do many scholars in these countries who might otherwise have been voices to stop the destruction and the genocide. Beyond the mere propaganda, the CCP also manipulated Islamic institution through a mechanism like a Chinese Islamic Association, which act as a labor organization. These groups function to cover up the genocide. As the world become increasingly aware of the orchestrated nature of pre-arranged mosque visits and utilizing Islam in its propaganda, China has been disturbingly successful in obtaining support from Muslim leaders and silencing outspoken civil society leaders who do winter to speak out. Surveillance mechanism have also been used as a tool of cutting, uh, cutting. Through its control of the Middle East and Central Asian countries, China has established a system as an alternative to the ex existing internet and has exported its communication and surveillance service to the Muslim countries 
through digital tech infrastructure, like uh, that Huawei ZTE and internet firewall system. Thanks to this technology, Beijing can monitor the entire environment, especially targeting any potential disturbance to the so-called peace which may come through transparent information regarding Beijing's heavy-handed tactics. Through Xi's establishing a global surveillance network, what was once confined to Eastern via giant human testing field is quickly becoming truly global. The Chinese Communist Party want to bring the world under its despotic regime. For this purpose, it has been developing systematic, sophisticated projects. Every year, thousands of Chinese have been educated abroad, especially in technology and industry. Likewise, before CCP took power, many intellectual, businessmen, scientists, and the capital fled to the surrounding countries before the establishment of the PRC in October 1949. However, after 1980s, they returned to China with the promises of immunity. To this day, each press conference, the Beijing government official claim that they respect all religious belief. One must wonder how widespread destruction equal respect. China hide its crimes with propaganda. The most visible and striking of this prospection is Belt and Road Initiative, which promises to bring equal development but the development that have emerged so far show that the untrue. There is only one winner in this economic welfare program, the Chinese communist regime. Beyond that name of BRI or shine with other investment, the Beijing government also export its own repressive regime. The first target of the, this regime export in the Central Asian and Islamic countries, whereas a significant part of their governments are authoritarian. The Chinese communist regime turns the rulers of authoritarian regime into satellite rulers for Beijing. These rulers are making billions at cost of their own Muslim people. The Chinese regime is menace that will trap the world. The crisis at the hand is deeply personal to me. Four years ago, almost exactly, I had what may be my last conversation with my mother. My brother, brother has been sentenced to over 20 years in a, one of the camps. My sister has vanished as well. The door to my family's home has been sealed shut, I am told. This caused me a pain that strikes me deep in my soul and knows no end. I know that I shall embrace my mother and my family once more, whether the, that be in the next life or in this one. It's not up to me alone, it's up to us, it's up to humanity, to the world. We must uh, ask ourselves what we'll do and behalf those who have been made incapable of acting. What will we say on behalf of those who cannot speak? Because of this, we must carefully avoid allowing scholarly approach and desire to the fear towards all viewpoints causing to the ignore the realities of this evil attacks on intellectual discourse and academic freedoms that we are privileged to take advantage of it this is also on the attack in the west as a the chinese communist party expand its control as a scholar can we say that genocide is evil can we say these attacks on identity lead to uh, gen to the genocide there is a particular kind of intellectual that feels they are being uh, superior by the maintaining neutrality. But how in the world can one can compare any situation to the China, communist China? In closing, I want to remind each of us of our responsibility. We are responsible as a scholar, but as a human being, as a citizen of humanity, use our intellect and our voice to call attention to the truth. The horror is what we are witnessing unfold today, having massive implication for the future of all. Today, the acts by the Chinese communist regime in Turkestan are on a pair with the Nazis action. The Chinese Communist Party forced international community, especially Central Asian and Islamic country to follow its own agenda by implementing the policies China's prepare. If the international community today surrenders to the China's economic and diplomatic tricks and continues to ignore the Uyghur genocide, 
it will allow the tragedies of the past to happen again. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Well, I was invited to step in and speak a little bit about um, what the situation has been with international response, particularly on the US side, uh, and a little bit about our organization, Campaign for Weepers, and what we are doing uh, in response to the atrocities that Mr. Idris has just described. So I did want to highlight actually a couple of things of what he just said before I kind of transition into speaking a little bit about our organizational response. And that being, you know, again, that these are on a level of something that's almost unimaginably horrific to be witnessing in, in the modern age. So we're looking at a repeat of um, expansion of the concentration camp system, crematoria built attached to these camps, um, the forcible separation of children from their families into state-run orphanage facilities where they are being uh, brainwashed and forced to effectively worship the Chinese Communist Party and Xi Jinping. Um, we're talking about women that are facing uh, sexual abuse, both in these camp facilities and outside in their own homes where Chinese Communist Party cadres have been moved in to supervise families and make sure that they are adhering to certain ideological standards as defined by the Chinese Communist Party. Um, so for these women that, whose husbands, brothers, fathers have been moved into the camps as most of the male population has disappeared, uh, this is quite a severe situation in and of itself. But on top of that, we have, um, what's effectively going to be the elimination of weaker babies being born. Um, so forcible sterilizations, mandatory birth control and uh, family planning policies, um, as well as forced marriages uh, are, are resulting in this type of horrific situation. In addition to that, we've heard increased testimonies even recently, I would encourage the audience to look at the uh, Weaver Tribunal that was held in the UK. They just recently had their third hearing this past uh, Saturday and they will be issuing a verdict of whether or not they believe this is genocide actually uh, on December 9th, so coming up very shortly. And they've even heard testimony from uh, Chinese uh, police that were involved directly in um, supervision in these detention facilities and camps and uh, just horrific accounts of torture. So what we're looking at here is something that's playing out, repeating history, but playing out in a modern way with this cutting edge surveillance technology, um, with the implementation of this uh, forced labor programs that are orchestrated by the state and amount to modern day slavery and the ways that Western corporations and businesses are implicated in this is, is something that, that really demands a response for the West, even beyond uh, our, our um, obligations uh, as signatories to the Genocide Convention to respond. We also um, could consider this uh, almost our own domestic issue in terms of corporate complicity. Um, so a lot of the pushback that we hear from the Chinese state, and this is distributed either directly through Chinese officials themselves, oftentimes even distributed via Western social media platforms that are denied to people in China, is kind of this line that um, this is China's internal affair and uh, the international community should mind its own business. So one of the things that we've really pushed back on consistently for the past few years and will continue to do is just to, again, tie in the ways that uh, the realities of our, our world and, and the way this is playing out are that this is very much our issue to address, particularly as concerns complicity and Uyghur forced labor. Uh, so one of the big things that our organization is involved in is uh, pushing for the appropriate legislative response here in the United States, as well as encouraging response uh, in, in other countries as well. But in particular, you know, when we are looking at companies like Apple, Nike, Coca-Cola, uh, one thing I would highlight in particular is the fact that most of the Olympic sponsors are very aware of what's happening and have decided to remain actively complicit. Beijing is hosting the 2022 Winter Olympics, not just hosting it, but effectively with our uh, American corporate support. So this is a horrific situation. Beijing has already hosted the 2008 Summer Olympics. Uh, faced quite a bit of pushback from human rights activists. This was effectively ignored, which Beijing took as a sign of affirmation that it could continue in its horrific human rights abuses and escalate them to this point of active genocide that we're observing today. So um, as concerns looking at corporate complicity, uh, we've done a lot regarding um, pushing for the passage of the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. Uh, so that's another piece of legislation I would encourage everyone to look at. Do call your representatives about supporting because it's kind of hit a wall at this point. 
Um, to speak quite candidly about what the situation here is here in the United States, we've had consistent bipartisan uh, support on this issue. It is so egregious. It is of such a horrific nature that it's really uh, something that's undeniably evil. And so we have seen consistent support from uh, both Republicans and Democrats. Uh, the Weaker Human Rights Policy Act passed last year almost unanimously. Um, and so that is an encouraging sign, but unfortunately we've seen a lot of that kind of drop off in the last couple of months as uh, there's begun to be this uh, shift in sort of policy approach to China that's moving towards appeasement. This is incredibly dangerous because the Chinese Communist Party has never demonstrated that it's willing to uphold any sort of treaty obligations in general, even if we're looking at uh, the issue separate from Uyghur genocide. So when we look at the situation of what uh, is facing Hong Kong, uh, even when we look at the issue of climate change and how China has uh, previously responded, um, you know, this new approach that's being taken by the administration at present, uh, he, most human rights organizations are quite concerned by because there's being presented this choice of sort of we have to choose between climate change and Uyghur genocide. And one of the major issues tied into this is that polysilicon, which is used in the production of solar panels, is produced primarily in the Uyghur homeland and thus is undeniably tied to slave labor. Um, so in the push to kind of ensure that as we're pursuing this green revolution or, or um, positive policies for climate change, uh, we want to, again, emphasize, and so this is something our organization is also uh, highlighting at present, that uh, the Uyghur people should not be sacrificed on the altar of uh, pursuing certain short-term um, checklists, if you will, regarding climate change. Climate change is also a human rights issue, and these two things are actually uh, closely tied. How the Chinese regime views the value of its own people um, and, and the value of pursuing positive policies to address uh, the climate crisis is also a human rights issue. And so a regime that is committing active genocide is not really a reliable partner on, on any issue. Um, so that's a little bit kind of a, about a, our policy uh, priorities at present and kind of some of the challenges that we are encountering. I don't wanna talk too long. I do wanna leave adequate time for conversation and questions as well. But our organization is involved in a lot of that advocacy. In addition to that, we do believe that uh, we need more civic society actors and grassroots organizations to take up the mantle of leadership to call on um, politicians, whether it be here in the United States or abroad, uh, and mobilize others to really respond to this crisis of our time. Um, and so we, we work a lot with mobilizing those organizations, in particular with highlighting the voices of women and youth. Uh, for advocacy, particularly because we can really see, um, I would highlight what's happening in the news even the last few weeks, if anybody's been following the saga of Peng Shui, the, the tennis player, the Chinese tennis player that has made allegations against a Chinese official of sexual assault and was disappeared, forcibly disappeared, uh, re-emerging under somewhat questionable circumstances to have these very um, uh, <laughs> uncomfortable video calls, uh, ironically, even with the International Olympic Committee, whose prerogative it is not to investigate these type of things, has kind of um, moved into uh, presenting themselves as part of the Chinese uh, regime's propaganda front. And there are massive implications of this. So when we see what the response is to someone who is so incredibly visible as an athlete uh, and her allegations of sexual assault, I would also encourage us to remember the situation that's facing Uyghur women, where we have uh, millions of people facing active genocide, women in particular have been singled out and their bodies used so effectively as uh, the tools to carry out genocide and, and targeted in particularly brutal ways. So while they're facing these situations of mass rape, um, forced marriages, forced sterilizations, and things that are absolutely unacceptable in the modern age and that the international community should not be turning a blind eye to, we would call on more uh, women's rights organizations to really um, take on this cause as well and speak out for those women. So we can really see the misogynistic nature of the regime, um, that, that a lot of the things that are happening are absolutely incompatible with international uh, human rights standards are really, um, uh, really effectively are proving that this is not a regime that we can comfortably engage with. Um, they must be held to account for these things. And so we, we, uh, we do a lot of our work really focusing on highlighting the voices of these women. Um, in particular, as I earlier mentioned, the Uyghur Tribunal, if you do have an opportunity to view the testimonies of some of these camp survivors, particularly the women that have come forward to share their stories, this is uh, incredibly impactful because it is countercultural, it is incredibly brave, and the women who are stepping forward to speak the truth about what they have faced and what millions of other uh, Uyghur Kazakh and other Turkic uh, women are facing, 
face incredible consequences. They are targeted by the Chinese state. They are smeared on our social media platforms and referred to using dehumanizing language, smeared as liars, adulteresses, uh, just this incredibly sexist, misogynistic, um, effectively slut shaming, for lack of a better term, vocabulary as, as, as means of pushback. And so these are all things that we want to highlight as well as really empowering women to be uh, leaders in this cause and, and, and share their stories effectively as well as youth. Because what we're seeing right now is that there's been very much a top-down approach to responding to genocide. Here in the United States, as I mentioned, we have incredible human rights activists like my, my boss, Rushan Abbas, who hopefully will be joining us soon, and many other organizations and individuals that have been doing the hard work for really decades in the United States of raising the plight of the, of the Uyghur people, that this is not a genocide that just happened overnight, but has been um, building as uh, human rights atrocities have continued to be ignored. And uh, because of that, uh, many of our politicians are aware of what's happening, but we see that civic society still remains unaware. And so we have a top-down approach and what we need is for civic society to continue to really take up the mantle of leadership as, as concerns addressing this. So that was a, a lot of information crammed into a few minutes, a little bit of information about uh, kind of our work and what we're doing. And, um, as, as I see that there have been some questions addressed in the chat, I'll kind of close there. And I know Mr. Idris and myself and hopefully Rishan shortly, we're very happy to engage with audience and answer any questions that anyone might have. Thanks, Julie. This is Tim DeRoach, the Director of Programs for World Oregon. Um, as we wait for um, Ms. Abbas to join us, I'm gonna jump into some questions that we're getting from people in the audience. Um, some, um, some really, really wonderful questions. Um, so, you, you point to the need for civil society and for people to not only be aware, but have action. How can individuals or concerned global citizens make an actual difference and give voice to this crisis? Sure, well, I'm happy to jump in and then maybe Mr. Idris can also share his perspective. Uh, there, are, there are many things. So we always encourage people to think through, um, you personally, what are your networks? who are your connections and who are the people that you can effectively mobilize. So I would kind of highlight a few things as being uh, things that individuals can do. So I mentioned calling your representatives, particularly if you're here in the United States as a US citizen, this is desperately needed. We also have, I mentioned the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, the Uyghur Human Rights Protection Act is another thing that is a vital piece of legislation that's necessary because we need to also offer protection to those who have managed to escape from the hands of the Chinese regime and those who are incredibly vulnerable, um, who maybe have escaped um, and are, are facing precarious situations in terms of residency. So we want to make sure that we're highlighting that uh, Uyghur refugees should also be a priority for the United States. So uh, calling your representatives about these pieces of legislation is one thing everybody can do. It takes a few minutes. If you hate talking on the phone, send an email, send a letter, do whatever you can just to touch base and let them know that this is a priority and, and um, that you're concerned about the situation. Additionally, I would encourage everyone to be looking at um, the brands that are complicit in using Weaver Force Labor and being a part of the solution in terms of addressing that. So there is, a, in particular, one resource that I would highlight for people is uh, there's a website they can go to end Weaver Force Labor. Um, and this uh, coalition to end Uyghur forced labor uh, will have information on the website about those brands that are implicated. They are working to engage with a lot of these and encourage them to extricate themselves from the Uyghur region and clean up their supply chains. To be perfectly honest, we have had an abysmal response here in the United States. And so what we desperately need is consumer pressure to be applied in conjunction with um, this type of legislative action like the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act that would hold these uh, companies accountable. We also want to start to let them know that consumers are becoming aware and they are doing a lot of reputational damage uh, in, in terms of refusal to extricate themselves from these situations. So if you will visit that um, website that I referenced, that's a good way to um, get involved and kind of monitor are the clothes that I'm buying, are the products that I am purchasing um, implicated in these things. And we would encourage you to write to those corporations as well and let them know that you won't be purchasing their brands and to bring other people on board using social media as well to call for boycotts um, of these is, is an effective tool right now, because as I mentioned, uh, it's still the case by and large that many people are not aware of what's going on as concerns forced labor. I see that uh, Rushan has just hopped on the call, so I will wrap up there. Um, and then Rushan, we were just speaking about things that concerned individuals can do uh, to be a part of stopping the genocide. So I don't know if Mr. Idris or Rushan would like to jump in. 
Thank you so much. And I'm very sorry. My apologies. Uh, this meeting came up in last minute. I couldn't reschedule. And the, uh, very good to be here and participate this panel. And my apologies again to everyone. Um, I'm here to answer any questions you have in last, what, uh, oh, we still have almost 30 minutes, actually. Yeah, actually, I might jump in. I'm sorry, I don't want to like take over moderating, but um, because uh, Hakim and I both spoke, Rushan, I wondered, you know, one of the things that I would love to highlight is Rushan actually, um, as our founder and executive director at Campaign for Uyghurs, has also a very personal connection to the crisis and can speak on a personal level about the types of repercussions that Uyghurs and diaspora are facing as a result of speaking out about the atrocities and the story of her sister. So I wonder, Rushan, if you might want to share on that for a few minutes. Yes, thank you, Julie. Today, actually, um, I am in this building, 1201 Pennsylvania Avenue. This is where all started. Um, on September 2018, I was in this very building that I came for this meeting this afternoon for and participated on the panel and the uh, talking about the, the genocidal policies of the Chinese communist regime while uh, highlighting the concentration camps and the outlining the fate of my in-laws, my husband, Abdul Hakim Idris, who has been speaking with you uh, earlier. His entire family was missing since April, 2017. So after participating, on this panel at the Hudson Institute in Washington, DC. My own sister, a retired medical doctor, uh, she was abducted as a retaliation for my activism here in America as an American citizen. More than three years now, since September, 2018, there's absolutely no information on her whereabouts. I don't even know if she is still alive today. I'm doing my advocacy work at the cost of my own sister's freedom. Um, unfortunately, my story is not unique. I am one of the millions of Uyghurs whose family members are taken as hostages. Um, there are about a million Uyghurs in diaspora. Uh, when you look at the Uyghurs in Central Asia and Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan and Turkey and the uh, Europe, Australia and North America, everybody you talk to, they have their family members are abducted. Um, most of these Uyghurs who are being held in the concentration camps, they have not charged with any kind of crimes. They're all innocent people. And the, uh, the most of the activists like my husband and myself, our family members are in detention as a hostages to silence us. What frustrates me is not only the Chinese regime is getting away with this genocide, but also getting rewarded by hosting the Olympics that's coming up the 2022 Winter Olympics. Most of the international communities are still silent. Hollywood, NBA, uh, when you look at all this rich and the famous, those celebrities who are very vocal against any kind of social injustice, when it comes to the China's war against the Uyghurs, they are silent because the perpetrator has the money and the power, everybody is basically um, turning a blind eye to this atrocity. Um, Rashan, this is uh, Tim DeRoche from World Oregon. I wanted to jump in with this and because we've had a couple people ask questions about the Olympics. Um, uh, you know, recently um, she had a, a sort of soft pedaled uh, diplomacy address before the UN. We've got the Beijing games on the horizon. Do you think that we're going to see a lessening of the crackdown, or do you think that um, do you think that we're, uh, China is still going to hold um, very tightly to what is going on in in the in the Uyghur territory? And is there anything that grassroots organizations or individuals can do to put pressure on the International Olympic Committee? Unfortunately, China is continuing 
with the crackdown. And just recently, actually, we just heard last couple of weeks, they are uh, arresting more people. Um, this all actually, you know, it got worse after the 2008 Beijing Olympics. That was the uh, uh, a huge turning point for China, basically uh, making a huge U-turn to open totalitarianism. Also, they were doing it all these times, but 2008 was sort of like a confirmation from the international communities to reward China with the uh, Beijing Olympic Games. And now um, they are continuing to do so. And the, uh, the unfortunately, the money, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the most of the companies who are making profit off of Uyghur slaves, blood, sweat and the tears, they are continuing to do business as usual with China. So as an individual, everybody can use their power to uh, take, a, uh, take a stand because um, there's no neutral side anymore because genocide is not something that people should tolerate. Um, people can boycott Chinese goods, and they can uh, contact their lawmakers and the uh, politicians to write to them, write to international communities, and they ask them at least in the bare minimum, our country should not be sending any diplomats. Um, you don't need to be an Uyghur or an activist to do the right thing and stop this genocide everyone can take a part of this um, campaign against China's genocide. Um, as little as refuse to buy the Chinese goods and the, um, uh, share the information, what you hear and share um, anything you see uh, like updated information from us or from our website, you can go to campaignforwigors.org and sign up for our mailing list and the, uh, keep yourself up to date with the, the recent uh, developments. And the uh, follow us on social media and our uh, Instagram, Facebook, and the Twitter accounts all is Campaign for Uyghurs. And my individual one is Rushan Abbas. So um, more that you share, and educate yourself and educate the others will help because the Chinese government is counting on the disinformation and the false narratives and the, all the lies they're spreading and the manipulation that they are uh, succeeding over the international communities. They are ignoring, ignoring the activists, ignoring the countries that are uh, implementing sanctions so the individuals need to uh, to be uh, you know uh, to be active and need to take action to stop this genocide. So last week or so, um, President Biden said that the U.S. was considering a diplomatic boycott of the Winter Olympics in China. Um, does that go far enough? And what can people do to put pressure on that decision? Um. As I said, you know, that is a bare minimum that we should expect from our country, but uh, that's not like a set decision yet. So uh, we don't want the administration to change its mind and the, the sent the diplomats. And we really need to pressure the administration and the, uh, our lawmakers to keep that word. You know, there is a consideration and we really need to see that happening. Um, yes, they are a parts that some uh, politicians are pushing forward to engage with China, but how could you engage with a government? Do not respect any sort of human dignity and do not respect the law and the regulations and keep lying about anything that they ever pro promised. If you look at what happened in Hong Kong, and what's happening to Tibetans and Southern Mongolians. 
and look, look, look at the, the active genocide that they are conducting, the slavery, modern day slavery. So we cannot treat the Chinese government as a legitimate organization, legitimate government. So we have to pressure our lawmakers and our administration to, to at least to do the diplomatic boycott. We need to see that fall through. So I'm curious um, how, um, I believe that um, Mr. Idris got at this a little bit, but how have the governments of Muslim majority countries reacted to China's crackdown on Muslim minorities? And how is this affecting bilateral relations with China and these other countries? So before they started this um, the massive sweeping off of the millions of people in the concentration camps, the Chinese government has been inoculating those Muslim countries with um, disinformation and the uh, uh, spreading the China's soft power on their mainstream media. And the most of those uh, Muslim majority countries, they don't have access to free uh, media. The government controls the media and the Chinese government, they have like a, a major part on their, like uh, the largest newspaper to uh, spread the like their so-called you know support to Muslims and also while they are demolishing all, all the uh, religious uh, facilities or the mosques in our homeland, they are building the largest mosque in Nigeria and they are uh, organizing an Islamic conference in Malaysia and Indonesia because if you look at the leaked documents, 403 pages of leaked documents um, from the New York Times uh, back in uh, November 2019, the Chinese high level officials, uh, they said it very clearly when they start to, uh, to implement this genocidal policies, the West will whine, this is their words, about human rights. And they said, ignore it and continue. Keep doing what you are doing. Focus on what you are doing. That was the order given from uh, Xi Jinping and the uh, high uh, level of Chinese officials in Beijing. But they do worry about the reaction from the, the Muslims and the Muslim majority countries. That's why they were using the debt trap diplomacy and the uh, uh, trade uh, as a tool and they are using the Belt and Road Initiative's power to keep those Muslim uh, leaders silent. But uh, what we have been doing and what uh, Abdul Hakim Idris has been uh, working uh, recently with the Muslims in diaspora, activating the Muslim organizations and asking them to raise awareness. Just recently, uh, just two weeks ago on November 13th, more than 50 Muslim organizations in UK, they put together a protest in London in front of the Chinese embassy is more than 5,000 people. So we need to work and engage more with the Muslim uh, civic societies and organizations in diaspora and educate them and ask them to pressure their leaders and their countries. Um, to come over of China's war on faith. So you, you've mentioned the, really what is going on for people in the camps, but for Uyghurs who have not been detained in camps, how has daily life uh, in that region changed? Is there any freedom of movement? And I think as somebody else asked, is there any reliable independent journalism or photojournalism coming out of the region? Um, that's a great question, Tim. Um, I have translated in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba for uh, two, almost two years. And they, I have worked with the, the innocent, the, the Uyghur people were there. Um, they were detained in Afghanistan as a part of um, you know, the innocent people being at the wrong place at the wrong time. They are all released now. But they compare their lives in Guantanamo to the regular people like you and me living in daily lives in East Turkestan. And they said, 
that as the detainees in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, they had more privileges because they could read religious and cultural books. They can pray as they wish and that they can fast during Ramadan and they don't need to eat pork or drink alcohol. But just the regular ordinary people in East Turkestan, they are living like in war zone, complete surveillance everywhere, checkpoints in every hundred yards and the QR scanning codes on everybody's home, GPS tracking devices on everybody's vehicles. So there is no, absolutely no any kind of freedom of movement, freedom of speech, or they don't even have a basic survival rights. The Uyghur women are forced to marry Han Chinese men. And if she refused to marry such a forced marriage, which is um, basically put together by Chinese governments, um, offering money, housing, and the jobs to those Han Chinese men to marry Uyghur women. If she says no for such a marriage, she will be taken to concentration camps as a Islamic extremist did not want to marry non-Muslim Han Chinese. And also Chinese government itself reported on the Chinese media 1.1 million Han Chinese cadres, Han Chinese men, deployed to Uyghur homes to live inside of their houses, supervise and monitor the Uyghur people's daily lives. And the most men are taken to the concentration camps or the forced labor facilities. The Uyghur women who left behind are subject to sexual abuse in their own homes. I call this government sponsored mass rape of the Uyghur women. And also through sham marriages, Uyghur women are subject to uh, rape basically. So that is the reality for the regular people they are, which are not in the concentration camps. Um, recent Chinese own data showed actually almost a million Uyghur children are deployed to state-run orphanages. So basically when you look at the five elements of the uh, genocide, every one of them that you can find in today's uh, the Uyghur situation. So basically the conscience of the humanity is at test and most of the world community are failing this test. So certainly we've got, you know, the CCP's control and state-sponsored media, but it brings up the question that is, is there any domestic support, um, though undoubtedly underground in China for the Uyghurs? Um, yeah, you asked that question earlier. I um, forgot to answer if there's any um, uh, journalism. Um, there are some Han Chinese people and went to the region and they just recently someone uh, released some video clips of his tour in, going into region. Basically, the, 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 the East Turkestan and the countryside is like a, no one left. You don't see any Uyghurs anywhere anymore because um, the neighborhoods were filling quotas to send to the concentration camps, sent Uyghurs to concentration camps and they sent them to forced labor facilities. So um, any support from the local, uh, uh, you know, other Chinese communities or local uh, people? I would say no. Um, the reason I say no is because when you look at the uh, 10 stages of the genocide, the first one is the uh, uh, labeling the group as the other. And then as uh, next step follows with, uh, demonizing the group and dehumanizing them, demonizing them and use their ethnicity and religion. That's what the Chinese government has been doing. Most of the Han Chinese people also became the victims of China's disinformation. And they look at Uyghurs as these uncivilized people. They are violent or they are backward. So 
there is a uh, PBS Frontline documentary which released uh, summer of 2020. At one part of the documentary, the journalist, um, uh, the reporter interviews a, a Han Chinese uh, person. And the, when he was talking about the, the policies in East Turkestan, the journalist asks, um, is that the violation of their rights? The gentleman giggles, laughs, and says, what rights? The Uyghurs don't have any rights. So it's really normal for Uyghurs to be treated like that because they are the secondary citizens or they don't have, they, they should not deserve any kind of uh, basic living rights or they shouldn't be uh, respected for any kind of human dignity. So you mentioned the, um, the, the points that define genocide. We've got a question here from somebody who says, I have a Chinese American student who's convinced everything that the German anthropologist Adrian Zentz writes on the Uyghurs is motivated by his anti-communist sentiments rather than truth. And this student is skeptical that what is happening is actually genocide. So what, what evidence outside of what Zentz and others write and uh, can she offer to the student to prove that this is truly not only a humanitarian crisis, but is in fact genocide? Adrian Zen speaks Chinese, fluent Chinese. He reads Chinese. He lived in China for many years. So everything Adrian Zen is analyzing or writing are come from Chinese government's own data. So basically, this Chinese student denying Adrian Zan's work means he's denying the Chinese government's own data in Chinese. There are three sets of leaked documents from the Chinese government on this Uyghur genocide. And they are in Chinese. They are available. Well, actually, four that just released on the 27th of November, just a few days ago. Um, all these documents states the intent, the intent of exterminating the Uyghur people. Um, unfortunately, there are many uh, denialists like this person that the, um, you know, this, uh, the audience here mentioned. They have several reasons for that. Um, maybe, you know, some of them genuinely believe that the Chinese government is telling the truth while the Chinese government is lying on everything. And the uh, Gini only think that it's not genocide, but many, many others who are denying, either they are getting some sort of, um, uh, I'm not accusing anybody, but uh, there's United Front, the Chinese government is activating all over the West at the universities and the, uh, on, the, on the other, you know, academic world and journalists. The Chinese government, the Chinese government made up actually recently a few interesting um, journalists, a French journalist, and they supposed to be you know, reporting uh, against the, uh, you know, what's happening to the Uyghurs and all that, and then find out that she did not exist. That was made up by the Chinese government. And then there's a Swedish um, researcher and wrote something and then Swedish embassy was uh, uh, tweeting and they releasing uh, uh, statements saying that we are looking for this person who we did not know. There's no such a person with that name and that, that the kind of background exists um, in, in Sweden. So if the Chinese government is not hiding anything, why are they going that kind of uh, you know, extent to, to hide or I mean, to, to cover up. Um, I was supposed to participate on the panel uh, put together by Columbia University a couple of years ago before the pandemic. After I arrived in Columbia University, it was me and another Tibetan activist and the Hong Kongers and one Southern Mongolian, four of us supposed to be on that panel. But when we got there, 
the Chinese students in Columbia University pressured the university, the Chinese Students Association to cancel our panel. In the United States, I felt like if I was in Beijing or if I was in the United States, I couldn't, I couldn't, you know, un, uh, I, was, I was shocked to experience this. And that's what's happening to our universities. So uh, I hope that, you know, the Chinese uh, students and the Chinese people do their own research in Chinese, read those leaked documents in Chinese and see this authoritarian regime for its genocidal crimes and the crimes against humanity. So all three of you brought up uh, some specific things about uh, doing business over there and the number of businesses that are, that are in essence supporting a, a system that is oppressing people. Uh, we have a question that from somebody in the audience as a business leader that does work with Chinese companies, what can we do to combat genocide? How should we be thinking about doing business with companies from that region and China more broadly? And then we have somebody else who asked and it sort of fits in there. Is there a short list of the major US companies who probably are selling forced labor goods in the US? Um, uh, I'm sure Julie will send the link. Um, I think that the website is uh, www. Um, and the UyghurForcedLabor.org, I believe. Um, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute reported um, in early 2020, there are more than 80 Western companies were using the Uyghur slaves for their supply chains and they were complicit with this genocide. And I think recently, again, there was a release for about 100 countries and the uh, 80, more than 80% of China's cotton output come from the, uh, the Uyghur slaves, you know, hand-picked cottons from East Turkestan. So I would say, do not, you know, any kind of business owners, any kind of um, my fellow Americans, the people with conscience, people who respect human dignity, should not continue to do business with China anymore because whatever you do, your business dollars only feeds this monster to the point that it's going to not only eradicate the Uyghur people, but demolish the democracy and the freedom of this world because it's not just the Uyghur's future is at stake here anymore. It's about this, the, the future of this free world, the future, the, the world that you are living for your grandchildren and your next generations, that's at stake right now. Um, therefore, you know, just like um, I'm going to give a, a, a quick comparison of what happened during the World War II, when the Nazi Germany was conducting Holocaust and the setting up concentration camps and running, uh, uh, a genocide, many Western companies and the countries continue to do business with the Nazi regime. And the uh, uh, basically making the, uh, you know, get, uh, basically offering the financial support to Nazi Germany to continue to kill more people. But then when it all ended, people tried to claim the ignorance also, they knew what was happening. They tried to say that information flow was too slow and they didn't know what was happening. But this is 2021. This is 21st century information era. The world community, the business community, the business owners, they know what's happening. So they cannot claim the ignorance anymore when their children look at their eyes and ask, what did you do to stop this genocide? So please don't just look at the short-term economic benefit that you are getting from China and be complicit in this genocide. 
Thank you, um, Rashawn. What you've pointed out is we all have a role to play. Yes. We don't need to be small in the face of something this large and that making ourselves heard or amplifying the voices for those who cannot make their voices heard on their own is, is exactly why World Oregon does programs like this. And I wanna thank you, all three of you for joining us today and turn things back over to Derek who will take us out into, uh, into the day. So thanks. Thank you, Tim. And thank you panelists for this sobering and crucial conversation. As Tim said, we uh, uh, always want to be bringing our audience um, the latest, even as it's very difficult to hear and grapple with because it's important that we do. And so uh, this program has been recorded and will be posted on YouTube later so that others who have not seen this can can um, listen and, and perhaps for some of the, the audience members who had questions about people who are skeptical, you could refer them to the video of this program. And, and there's many links in the chat with other resources. Uh, we're gonna be grappling tomorrow with another uh, challenging relationship, the US and Iran. I just posted in a link in the chat for that. It's a free program uh, uh, with an author uh, about uh, the history of US-Iran relations. Uh, again, I thank all of you for joining us uh, today. Um, you know, if you're able to uh, support World Oregon, I encourage you to do so to help it make us possible for us to host events like this. I'd like to thank our three panelists for their time and their candor on what's a very difficult subject. And, um, and I thank the audience for uh, being here with us today. Uh, stay well, stay healthy, and um, we'll see you at our next program. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.